Thanks a lot, Scott. Uh, I'm really, I'm really impressed by your your setting here, by uh, the little village that constitutes this museum, and and um, I'm very happy to be here this evening. I want you to know that this is the first time I've given this lecture. I wrote it specially just for you, <laughs> so I so I hope you like it. On January 13th of 1864, Frederick Douglass delivered a speech to the Women's Loyal League of New York City on the mission of the war. It was a speech he had delivered on several previous occasions during that winter. The subject was and remains controversial because it unveiled a version of history that many Americans had not accepted then and still do not accept. 1864 was an election year, and not all Americans were committed to Abraham Lincoln's evolving position that the war must eventually become an anti-slavery crusade. The speech restated principles hinted in the Gettysburg Address, which had, after all, made no specific mention of slavery, and it anticipated ideas that Lincoln was yet to state in his second inaugural address. But the outcome of the election was not certain, and the second inaugural address was still 14 months in the future. The speech was not devoid of religious implications, and Douglas was indeed a believer in the workings of providence in his own life and in human history. His speeches and his writings often implied a faith that American history was a process of moral development. But in this speech, he cautioned his audience, which was dominated by respectable Christian progressive women, to look for no miraculous destruction of slavery. And he cautioned against thinking that providence had already struck slavery dead. He stated that he would prefer to look facts sternly in the face and to accept their verdict, whether it blast us or bless us. He viewed the war as a great national opportunity, which may be improved to national salvation or neglected to national ruin. Following the secessionist capture of Fort Sumter on April 13th of 1861, Douglas had written in his own news, uh, in his own uh, uh, newspaper, Douglas Monthly, they have completely shot off the legs of all trimmers and compromisers and compelled everyone to elect between patriotic liberty and pro-slavery treason. That was the way he defined it. But while he felt that the rebellion had forced the issue of slavery in the United States to a crisis, he did not insist, nor did many unionists at that time maintain, that the North was fighting to free the slaves. In fact, in, mo in less impassioned moments, Douglas admitted, as did almost everyone in 1861, that the North was fighting only to preserve the Union. The Southerners, of course, insisted that the war was being fought to preserve slavery. This was the position of Jefferson Davis. It was the overwhelming opinion expressed in the Southern press. It was the opinion of those states that officially issued secessionist resolutions articulating their reasons for, for seceding. We are seceding in order to preserve slavery, period. As for Lincoln, he insisted that the war was only about preserving the Union. And for this reason, Douglas profoundly distrusted him. Although Lincoln was unquestionably opposed to slavery on moral grounds, he made it clear that he was willing to make a Machiavellian compromise on his moral principle. He famously stated in a letter to Horace Greeley, my paramount objective in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. 
what I do about slavery and the colored race I do because I believe it helps to save the Union and what uh, and what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. Thus, at the beginning of the war, the South was fighting to sl take slavery out of the Union and the North was fighting to keep slavery within the Union. Of course, today, we don't like to put it that way. Southern rhetoric centered on the idea that the election of Lincoln presented a threat to its peculiar institutions and culture, while the president insisted that he was not an opponent of slavery where it already existed. As the war progressed, the polls shifted. Everybody tell us there have been these polar shifts. You know, the North Pole becomes a more magnetic. Well, here's a polar shift. The polls shifted as the, as the, as the, um, as the, um, of course, uh, as the war went on and the South became increasingly inclined to claim that it has seceded over political and economic principles and to de-emphasize slavery as the principal cause. By contrast, Lincoln not only employed the radical rhetoric of Christian abolitionism, but did so to such an extent that he seemed to breach the wall of separation between church and state and employed an apocalyptic rhetoric in his second inaugural address. Fondly do we hope and fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled up by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk and every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid for with another drawn with a sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Douglas wrote, the address sounded more like a sermon than like a state paper. It was indeed very different in tone from the an analysis uh, that Douglas had provided in 1864. The war was, he, as he always saw it, a moral struggle to be sure, but a moral struggle ma proceeding from material facts. And this whole question of materialism and idealism is something that, of course, is beginning to be talked about. Obviously, Karl Marx is already on the scene, so this materialism, idealism stuff is very, very important in American authors at that time. And what Doug, this is where Douglas is involved, this whole question between materialism and idealism is very, very central to the speech that he gave. The interpretation Douglas offered was neither an argument based on moral premises nor a prediction of what he hoped would occur through the workings of providence. His addresses of the winter of 1863 and 1864 were a description of the stages by which a war which the president had originally asserted was purely to preserve the Union, had evolved into a war which the president admitted was a war against slavery. And while Douglas did not reject the idea that history was governed by, as he put it, persistent and eternal forces that moved, as he put it, with the trade winds of omnipotence, he asserted in practical and material terms the abolition of slavery is the comprehensive and logical objective of the war. So you notice that the religious rhetoric he uses is very similar to that of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. No, no, no Jesus rhetoric here. It's always uh, in terms of omnipotence or divine power, that sort of thing. Uh, but he, but he, doesn't, he doesn't get it into this evangelical rhetoric which other, which other people are using at the time. Julia Ward Howe, for example, is very, is very evangelical. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Uh, Douglas was born, but that's not where Doug Douglas is at. He's, he's trying to give you a material, a material interpretation of why, of why this is unfolding, uh, of why this is going to unfold uh, in, in a specific way. So, so in some ways, he's kind of like these German idealists like Hegel and, and, their, and, and his disciple in America, Ralph Waldo Emerson. But on the other hand, it's a kind of, it's, it's, he's, he has co-discovered uh, not been influenced by, but co-discovered this material interpretation of history that we associate with Karl Marx. Douglas was born a slave in 1818 near Tuckahoe Creek in Talbot County, Maryland. He could remember seeing his mother on only one occasion at around the age of seven. He never knew his father, whom he presumed to be a white man and possibly his master, Aaron Anthony, an overseer of several plantations belonging to Edward Lloyd, who was the owner of some 500 slaves. 
Douglas had the good fortune to be chosen as the companion and playmate of Daniel, youngest of the Lloyd children, and from this association he learned to speak the standard English of upper-class whites. This is very important. Contact with upper-class whites led him to experience some alienation from the other slaves, and one occasion, on one occasion, he was attacked by another boy who struck him on the forehead with a sharp piece of cinder fused with iron from a blacksmith's forge. His caretaker, a slave woman named Aunt Lucy, blamed him for the incident, saying that it would do him good, and said, I would now keep away from them Lloyd niggers. Why she should put things in this degrading way would seem to reflect hostilities within the plantation community and some feelings of resentment towards those slaves who were associated with the Lloyds and who presumably enjoyed certain status, privileges, and opportunities for improvement that other slaves did not experience. Douglas later remarked on the kind treatment he received from Lucretia Auld, one of the daughters of Captain Anthony. This young woman, who was quite possibly his half-sister, bound up his wound and often supplemented his meager diet with a slice of sugared bread. Miss Lucretia's husband had relatives in Baltimore, and Douglas was sent to live with them at around the age of eight. He was comparatively well treated at first and sat at table with the family. Sophia Ald, his new mistress, began to teach him to read. He might have had some knowledge already, if you see where I'm coming from, given, who, given the exposure he had. Uh, to, to, but her husband brought these lessons to an end, saying that education made slaves discontented and rebellious. Douglas continued to study in secret, coming into contact with the abolitionist work of John Quincy Adams through newspaper accounts and experiencing several frustrations in attempting to teach reading and writing to his fellow slaves. For three years, he was sent off to work as a field hand, but eventually he was brought back to Baltimore, where he worked in the shipyards and described the efforts of white bosses to keep up hostilities between white and black workers for the purpose of keeping both groups in an inferior position and at low wages. So he, run, he understood this whole question about dividing the labor force and using this racism as a means of keeping the workers from being able to unionize. And so you've got this, con this conflict, this problem that Booker T. Washington talks about and others talk about this whole problem. My dad, for example, was, skilled, was a skilled worker. My grandfather was. Uh, but he, and he was always supported the Union, always supported the Democratic Party, even though these, the white Union would not allow him to practice his trade. Fortunately, he also had a college degree. Um, in, in 1838, he became engaged to Anna Murray, a free African-American woman who assisted his escape to freedom. Moving first to New England, then to New York, he joined the abolition movement, befriended William Lloyd Garrison, with whom he later quarreled over several issues, notably whether the United States Constitution legitimized slavery. Eventually, he struck on his, on his own as an anti-slavery lecturer, newspaper editor, and author. He toured Scotland, England, and Ireland, supported the revolutionary mood of movements in those countries as well. You know, if you, if you take the position, you, it's our thing, you won't understand it, well, perhaps other people will respond by saying, you're right, we don't. But his attitude was, I understand what's going on in Hungary, I understand what's going on in Greece, I understand what's going on in these various other countries, and we see our liberation movement in connection with these, with these national struggles. So on the one hand, he's not really a black nationalist, and on the other hand, he is. David Blight makes this point in his biography, I think, he's very well. He toured Scotland, England, and Ireland. And he became not only an abolitionist, but a public intellectual. One of the good things you notice about this guy's writing and his speeches, and you notice this about many of his other African-American contemporaries, is they're not always confined to, to racial issues, but are, are, are constantly uh, seeking opportunities to express themselves on other uh, issues of the day, on other, other philosophical concepts, theology, uh, history of science, history of the arts, etc., the history of literature, and you find that Douglas's uh, writings are replete with references to British authors. And of course, you'll find that in his contemporary, Al Alexander Crummel. And I hope I'll get some questions about Alexander Crummel. Alexander Crummel was pure black, had no, not a drop of white blood. He went to Cambridge University, and he and Douglas uh, sometimes argued about some things. In the spring of 1857, at the time of the Dred Scott decision, over five years before Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, Douglas not only disagreed with the moral implications of the decision, but with the originalist reasoning of Justice Taney. 
this whole question about originalist as opposed to in original intent. Uh, originalist and originalist intent. You should find that uh, there's a lot, very nice uh, literature on that. Uh, I, I read up on some of um, uh, what um, Justice Scalia has to say about this whole question. It's very interesting. Uh, he behaves as a Supreme Court justice ought to behave, much as I disagree with everything he says. I, I, I have to, I admire him for, for behaving as a Supreme Court justice ought to behave, and I will not name anyone who I would contrast with him. Uh, there is, uh, but he, but he does, he, there, there's this whole question about original intent and textualism. What does the document say on, on parchment? And then what is the original intent of the founders when they wrote it? And, and Douglas is very deeply involved in this on a very sophisticated level. Um, uh, the Chief Justice had declared that the original meaning of the phrase, all men are created equal, in the Declaration of Independence did not apply to African Americans. The Chief Justice had argued that it would have make them utterly and flagrantly inconsistent if they had meant, if they had, if it had applied to them, for the founders to have intended to issue a universal declaration of rights that included slaves, that they couldn't have. But we'd look at the context of the times or, or any other portion of the African population that the Constitution, so that the Declaration, and note he merges the Declaration and the Constitution. So if any of you are high school teachers and you get, you don't have to get too angry with your, with your, uh, with your students for mixing the two up, because as a matter of fact, Justice Taney did too. And, uh, and so in fact, uh, Clarence Thomas recently said that, that it's legitimate to do that. Uh, uh, you, you, can't, you can't go off and look elsewhere, but you can, in fact, cite the Declaration in order to interpret the Constitution. Douglas responded to the pronouncement of Taney in a speech before the American Anti-Slavery Society on May 11, 1857, two months after the Dred Scott decision, that the founders of the Republic did indeed intend to include African Americans. His opinion advanced the spurious but progressive argument that the founders had originally intended to create an anti-slavery republic, and uh, the historians are still arguing about that today. While he, would, while he could produce convincing evidence to support this point, it was impossible to deny Taney's position that the Constitution contained such pro-slavery provisions as the Three-Fifths Compromise, support for the international slave trade, and a fugitive slave law. These were all there. But James Madison said at the time, you go back and read the records, he says, we've got to keep slavery out of this. We can't keep the word slavery in the Constitution. This is James Madison's position. You know, you got, you know, remember, the Constitution was a conspiracy. It was literally in a smoke-filled room with everyone sworn to secrecy and the doors locked. It was a conspiracy. George Washington almost didn't want to take part. He said, this is a conspiracy. You know, I could lose my reputation by being involved in this. Uh, but Madison persuaded him. He said, well, we'll, we'll keep everything here quiet. So we, won't, uh, we, we, we won't communicate with anyone outside. He goes and writes letters to Thomas Jefferson. He's in Paris. He <laughs> leaves everything that's happening. But that's okay. Uh, uh, both Justice, uh, both Douglas and Taney were implied to read the Declaration as part of the, of the uh, Constitution then. The founders had found, the, had found this uh, references to slavery uh, embarrassing. The argument, uh, although an example of the purest textualism, this is the argument that Douglas began to advance, was pure textualism, but it was of dubious merit when, pressured, when measured against original intent. The debates at the Constitutional Convention made it clear that the words of these articles were indeed circumlocutions for slavery, which indicated that the framers considered the word embarrassing while nonetheless tolerating the institution. It is absolutely certain that Douglas was aware of the Constitution's pro-slavery content, but after several years of reading the Constitution in terms of its original content, intent, Douglas came to recognize the usefulness of giving it a fundamentalist or literal reading. And you notice the Supreme Court justices do this today. Thomas Jefferson was great for doing this. You know, when I want to make, give you a literal reading, I'll give you a literal reading. And when I want to give you a broad construction, I'll give you a broad construction. They say, so there's this idea that, again, that we teach our kids in high school that Thomas Jefferson believed in, in uh, strict construction and Alexander Hamilton in broad construction, you know, <laughs> come on. We all know human nature. They shifted around uh, and they were, they were quite practical about, about where they stood on that issue. Both Douglas and Taney were inclined to read the Declaration as if it were part of the Constitution. 
Douglas as it were, however, that any reason to place these documents on the side of slavery was morally sterile. He said, well, I may be, I may be arguing uh, the position that, that I'm arguing, but it's morally sterile. It's better for me to take the other position. It's better for me to take this, this, uh, the position that says, well, where, where does it say slavery? And why, why is this better from a moral standpoint? Because now I'm placing myself on the side that says, true or false, that the founders of this republic were making a universal moral statement. He didn't care whether it was true or false. It's more convenient. It's, it's better. It was necessary and convenient. Um, yeah, to say that, this concept, that the Declaration and the Constitution were, were indeed anti-slavery. Necessary and proper. Isn't that the word? Necessary and proper, yeah. Uh, embarrassing. Douglas was aware of this uh, plus there. Well, he, did. he moves to this fundamentalist or literal reading because it puts him on the right side of history. And he's got a sense of history. See, so he says he believes that this uh, principle of history, the German philosopher Kant, and the history is the expansion of the consciousness of the idea of freedom. Both Douglas and Tawney were inclined to read the declarations of a republic, and it had little inspirational value for the United States or for the rest of the world if we read it to say that those guys were a gang of slaveholders who, who didn't think, no, they really were idealists. They really did mean us too. And then you see the Declaration of Independence becomes something more. Uh, the Declaration, if the Declaration was, as its authors had claimed, written from a decent respect for the opinion of nations, Thomas Jefferson's words, as it says, a decent respect for the opinion of nations, then it must also have a significance extending beyond the provincial concerns of 13 little colonies or its authors' interests as slaveholders. It must have some larger meaning, again, Jefferson's words, in the course of human events. He says, they're going to, and they're picking. He says, he says, it's great for you guys to argue that the Constitution is pro-slavery and Massachusetts should secede from the Union, but where does that take us? I'm going to say, I'm going to take the other side. I'm going to be a literary critic, not a lawyer. I'm going to read this Declaration of Independence as if it's part of the Constitution, and I'm going to read this Constitution as if it is a document of universal significance. Thomas Jefferson and that committee with Roger Sherman and Livingston and Benjamin Franklin and Adams, they produced a document for the ages. It wasn't, it wasn't just a list of grievances against King George. No, it's a philosophical statement. And this is where a lot of liberals stand today. Right? So you have a lot of liberals who, who, are in, who, who really want to read the Constitution in that way. Uh, and that puts liberals and conservatives on the same side. <laughs> See, because now liberals and conservatives say, it really is an intellectual document, and these people really work with profound thinkers. Douglas uh, responds to the Dred of course, you know, okay. Douglas' response to the Dred Scott decision in 1857 was a forerunner of Lincoln's response to position on the Gettysburg Address. It took the, and this is in 1857, before, you know, several years before the, the, the Gettysburg Address, it took the meaning of the Declaration and the Constitution outside of the particularities of the past and made them both into statements that could be justified in terms of the view of the present and the future. Lincoln at Gettysburg delivered a rhetorical response to the Dred Scott decision in which we not only reiterated what Douglas had said in 1857, but validated the universal and futurist meaning. Both addresses began with an allusion to the number of years since the founding, and both stressed the potentially universal and providential significance of that founding. Lincoln resorted, as had both Douglas and Justice Taney, to the Declaration to find meaning in the Constitution. Like Douglas and unlike Taney, uh, Lincoln viewed the Constitution not in terms of the original discussions that had taken place secretly in Philadelphia, but rather in terms of an open interpretation of its public words. And these words, when linked to the Declaration, offered the potential to give a new birth to liberation movements in the entire world, well into the 20th century, well into our own day. In following after Douglass' interpretation of the Declaration of Independence, Lincoln made it effectively a part of the Constitution. 
as I've said, as others, including Taney and Senator Charles Sumner, were determined to do. And Lincoln was not only refuting Taney, but reiterating a point that Andrew Jackson had once made with respect to a decision by John Marshall. Remember what John Marshall had said, you know, that, that uh, the Chief Justice has spoken. <laughs> now he's the, 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 he's the Chief uh, Justice has interpreted the Constitution, now let him enforce it. So what, what, what Lincoln is saying, in effect, in the, Decla in, the, in the Gettysburg Address is, Roger Tawney has made his decision, now let him enforce it. I'm the guy with these armies here, right? <laughs> if Justice Tawney can say whatever he wants it to say, whatever, well, he still wasn't dead. Justice Taney died on October 12th, uh, 1864, the same day that his state of Maryland abolished slavery. By that time, the Union armies were already, and he really didn't like Taney and Jackson for this whole business of abolishing the Bank of the United States because, you know, the Bank of the United... Guy was a Republican, man, you know what I mean? That's what Lincoln is all about. He's a railroad lawyer, a Republican, and a fan of big business. You've got to remember, that's all what about... You know, this is Hamilton won the Civil War, and Jefferson lost it. By that time, the Union armies were already enforcing the Emancipation Proclamation, liberating the slaves wherever they advanced. The 13th Amendment abolishing slavery was pending and would be passed by the Senate on April 8th, although its ratification was still a year in the future. Despite the fact that these events had not yet occurred in January, Douglas could nonetheless deliver an address based on actual events within recent history, events that confirmed his position on the meaning of both the Declaration and the war. His statement on meaning was, he insisted, based on self-evident events, and he felt no need to present a quasi-theological interpretation of history, nor was he relying on pure reason either, neither on religion nor reason. It was with some validity that he claimed, I do not intend to argue, but simply to state the facts. The first of these facts were evident by January of 1864 was the changed character of the war. At the beginning, the object of the war had been to risk the restoration of the Union, but now its mission had become national regeneration. This implied not only the legal emancipation of the formerly enslaved persons, the moral growth of the nation, as he put it, that came with the fact that it was well along towards becoming an abolitionist war. What business then have we, he said, what business then have we to be pouring out our treasure and shedding our blessed best blood like water for the old, worn out, dead and buried union which had already become a calamity and a curse? So, see, he's, he's, he's right here where the Marxists and the Southern conservatives have the same interpretation. It's the North that's in revolt. It's not the South that's in revolt. Karl Marx says it's the North that's revolting. And said Jefferson Davis says the same thing. And even today, you can turn to conservative websites and blogs and you will see the idea that you will continue to see it's the North that was revolting, not the South. And most American historians and all our friends at the University of Moscow would agree. It was the North that revolted, right? It was a revolt. It was a revolt of a progressive capitalist industrialist state against an old-fashioned agrarian state. That's the standard Marxist interpretation, and that is the standard Southern, Southern conservative interpretation. The second fact was that the shifting war aims had placed the United States in a higher moral position on the international stage with respect to its dealings with Britain and other nations where public opinion already inclined to support the Union was strengthened from abolitionism when abolitionism became a war goal. The third fact was that by executive order, President Lincoln had freed the slaves. When I asked my students, what did, the, what did, what did, uh, what did, what did uh, President Lincoln do? Uh, when I was in college, they said he freed the slaves. Nowadays, when you ask students, they'll say he suspended habeas corpus. <laughs> then, although Douglas did not belabor this point by ignoring the fugitive slave provisions of the Constitution and by encouraging the slaves to free, flee, and by protecting them from their owners with the armies under the Union banner, he had overridden Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3 of the United States Constitution by executive order. He was violating the Constitution. Damn right! But then Douglas said, we've got to get rid of the old Constitution anyway. He said, like, you know, the French have a Second Republic, the Third Republic. Well, if you want to look at it that way, it's the Second Republic. The, the, after the Civil War, we get the Second Republic. And then with the New Deal, we get the Third Republic. We don't like it. 
It's those crazy Frenchies who are always, you know, we don't know, we've got the same republic. We really do. You say, in fact, we've got the same republic we had even before the concept, even before the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, the same republic we had at the time of the Tea Party. Of course, there wasn't a republic, but that's okay. The shift in Lincoln's position on the fugitives came uh, with more deliberation than speed. And it did not spell the end of racism, since blacks were still disrespectfully handled by the Union Army. Furthermore, in the area of public accommodations, they were subjected to indignities. And the threat of racial violence against black Americans was ever present. Some of you may know that the first Rosa Parks uh, uh, was, was, uh, was defended uh, because of her, uh, when she integrated the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the streetcars in New York, and I think that would have been 1857, and her lawyer was uh, Chester A. Arthur. So this whole question about Republican presidents, you know, enforcing uh, civil rights is a very interesting topic for someone ought to take up. Uh, Douglas mentioned the thousands of dignities to indignities to which, of course, Arthur wasn't president yet. Uh, Douglas mentioned the thousands of indignities to which he and other African Americans were subjected and hostility towards them of the press. He might also have mentioned the New York draft riots of the previous year, which were partially in response to the ironic fact that working class Irish, Irish immigrants were being subjected to the draft while African Americans were not, since they were not considered citizens. The purpose of the war, in Douglas' view, was not, must not simply be to achieve liberty, but to achieve equality for the African-American once freed. Douglas met with Abraham Lincoln for the first time on August 10th of 1863 at the White House, on which occasion Lincoln greeted him respectfully, cordially, rose to shake his hand and said, Mr. Douglas, I know you, I have read about you, putting me quite at ease at once. The two men discussed the maltreatment of colored troops in the Union Army, with Douglas responding to Lincoln's demands for particulars with the following. First, the colored soldiers ought to receive the same wages as those paid to white soldiers. Second, the colored soldiers ought to receive the same protection when taken prisoner. And if Jefferson Davis should shoot or hang colored soldiers in cold blood, the United States government should retaliate in kind and agree without delay upon Confederate prince prisoners in its hands. Third, when colored soldiers perform great and uncommon service on the battlefield, they should be rewarded by distinction and promotion, precisely as white soldiers are rewarded for their services. In one respect, Douglas was disappointed in his meetings with the president. He never received a military commission. Both the president and the secretary of war assured him that he would get it in the mail, but he never got it. For this reason, then, we may say that President Lincoln's dealing with Martin R. Delaney, the African-American physician and Liberian explorer, perhaps held greater significance, symbolic significance, than did his meetings with Douglas. Delaney was a man, as they used to put it in those days, a man of unadulterated African ancestry, a matter of great importance by the standards of the time. Lincoln spoke with Delaney on February 8th of 1865 and followed the meeting with a letter to Secretary of War Edward Stanton saying, do not fail to have an interview with this most extraordinary and intelligent black man. In March 1865, Delaney was resultingly commissioned as a major and the first African-American officer in the United States Army and became a recruiter for the Massachusetts 54th. Douglas' second meeting with Lincoln was on August 25th, 1864, and at this point the president expressed his anxiety that slaves were not yet fleeing to Union lines. Fast enough or in large enough numbers, he asked Douglas to organize a mission to make the slaves aware of the Emancipation Proclamation and encourage them to escape from the South. Douglas listened, he said, with the deepest interest and profoundest satisfaction at his suggestion. Some people see this as sort of like what John Brown was trying to do. Now, but now the difference is, of course, it's not John Brown doing it and not finding anybody to support him. Now you got the Union Army is doing it. <laughs> with, the, with the deepest interest and profoundest satisfaction, he said, now putting it, you know, this great capacity he had for understatement, uh, agreed to undertake the organizing of a band of scouts composed of colored men whose business should be somewhat after the original plan of John Brown, to, <laughs> he, couldn't, he, he had to get that in, to go into the rebel states behind the lines of our armies and carry the news of emancipation and urge the slaves to come within our boundaries. Of course, Harriet Tubman, 
who uh, was called General Tubman, uh, was, was, was doing this already and continued to do this throughout, throughout the Civil War. I noticed that in, in a very, very fine book, which I was reading on the airplane, that Harriet Tubman was not, was not mentioned in this connection, nor was Martin Delaney, which I thought was kind of interesting. Oh, it was a very fine book. I really enjoyed it. Thomas uh, Douglas, uh, until this point, had been impatient with Lincoln's conservatism and was leaning towards supporting the radical Republican candidate for President John Fremont, Fremont. He, uh, he has an accent over it, so I guess he wanted to be called for a moment. He's, uh, he's shifted to a full endorsement of Lincoln after the Democratic Convention in Chicago, he says. Uh, the nominee, George B. McClellan, was a war Democrat, but he was willing to negotiate a truce with the Confederacy without any insistence on emancipation. From that point on, uh, Lincoln decided he'd better quit playing patty cake, uh, because in some in the, the past he had sometimes said, well, I'll go ahead and vote for the really radical Republican or the really radical Free Soiler, uh, uh, and because I know that the the Republicans going to win. But this time he said, no, I can't do that. I better go ahead and vote Republican. The Republican Party is the ship, and all else is the sea. He said later on. From that point on, uh, Lincoln and, and, and Douglas uh, had com Douglas complete support, although Fremont did not Fremont did not uh, withdraw his candidacy until September 1864. Douglas had a third meeting with the president on March 4th at the White House reception after the inauguration, where he was once again greeted cordially, after uh, some functionaries tried to keep him out. Douglas' meetings with uh, Andrew, uh, with Abraham Lincoln, were a demonstration of Lincoln's evolution on the question of social equality between the races and symbolized the brightening prospects of possibility for racial amity after the Civil War. Douglas was not the only African American with whom uh, Lincoln met. He received jo Joseph Jenkins Roberts, the former president of Liberia, but did not meet with two Liberian commissioners for immigration. You recall that Liberia was the colony established by Henry Clay, Bushrod Washington, Andrew Jackson, and others as the haven, as the, as the black Zion, as the black Israel, uh, in, uh, in, in the, it became independent in 1847. Uh, but uh, Jefferson, who had advocated colonization, never supported it, by the way. Um, he received uh, Robbins, and also two Liberian commissioners for immigration. Uh, but he did not meet with the Liberian commissioners for immigration. Alexander Crummel and J.D. Johnson, who came to ask that funds provided by the District of Columbia Emancipation Act be used to support immigration to Liberia. Lincoln claimed to favor immigration to South America. Lincoln encouraged immigration throughout the early years of his administration, although he placed no pressure on black leaders for a quick decision. And indeed, he wrote to Alexander Crummel acknowledging that those African Americans who favored immigration had never accepted the idea of forced immigration. Alexander Crummel gave, after getting a degree from Cambridge University, uh, passing examinations in uh, Greek and Latin, he went to Liberia for 20 years as a, as a missionary, and then returned, came back to the States, where he influenced a lot of younger blacks, including W.B. Du Bois and uh, some of the uh, elements of the Guardian movement. But uh, Crummel, you can ask me about later. Very good counter counterpoint, sort of like uh, Douglas, and, Douglas and Crummel, sort of like uh, Jefferson and Hamilton. There had been uh, military victories in 1863, but these were yet to be followed by those of 1864. The year was to witness the fall of Atlanta, the siege of Petersburg, General Philip Sheridan's repulsion of Jubal, T. Early, Jubal Early's uh, attack on uh, <laughs> Jubilation T. Cornpone. Yeah. <laughs> Jubal, T, Jubal Early's attack on Washington and William T. Sherman's uh, devastation of Atlanta. These, are, these all strengthened Lincoln's position in the November election and led to per passage of the 13th Amendment, which freed those slaves who were unaffected by the Emancipation Proclamation. Thus, the war had achieved a number, had already achieved a number of victories for the abolitionist cause, and thus Douglas was confident in asserting that the war's mission was liberty, not on the basis of an abstract theological argument, not on the basic of, basis of logic, not on the basis of reason, but on the basis of facts. And this is very interesting because Douglas is coming along at the time uh, you know, when, when we're having this, this the, the culmination of this scientific revolution, uh, you know, in the, in, the early, in the early years of the scientific revolution, so much is based on reasoning and on mysticism, as, for example, in Isaac Newton. 
And one of the great innovations of Benjamin Franklin is that he, he says, before we talk about coming to a conclusion, let's have a method, scientific method. Very important. And this idea that Jefferson had no concept of this. That's why he wasn't a scientist, and Franklin was. Uh, Frank, Franklin's obsessed with scientific, he, he develops scientific method. That's what's important. And Douglas, and Douglas is using a scientific method here in his analysis of this war. He's not saying, well, we're going to win because God's on our side. We're going to win because of these reasonable arguments I'm going to make. No, he says, he says we can see these material differences that have occurred as a result. We've had these victories that we're talking about. Uh, the 13th Amendment is on its way to passage. Uh, you've got all of these slaves fleeing to the Union lines. And... Um, he would refer to the staggering blows dealt upon the rebellion that year by the armies under Grant and Sherman, and his own great character ground all opposition to dust and made his election sure. He believed that what, reassured, what assured Lincoln's uh, election in the long run, although he believed that history, he did believe he was not a pure materialist. Neither was Karl Marx. He believed, he believed that ideas have moral force, but, but, he says, we're talking about the material forces here. You, know, you can't, you know, what is it? You know, the, the, the principle is uh, ultima ratio is uh, the, the slogan that Cardinal Richelieu used to have stamped on his canons. Ultima ratio, the last reason. <laughs> and uh, and uh, not, not only that, I think, I think uh, Louis XIV had that stamped on his canons. And so did, uh, so did uh, Frederick II of Prussia. He also stamped that on his cannon. So it was uh, the last, the last reason is this cannonball. But in January, uh, Douglas is far more assured, far from assured that the outcome was certain. For he said, "I know that the acorn evol involves the oak, but I know that the communist accident, communist accident, may destroy its potential character and defeat its national destiny." He thought that our destiny, as he put it, is not to be taken out of our hands. It is cowardly to shuffle our responsibilities upon the shoulders of providence. Hey, got nothing against you, Julia, uh, Julia Ward Howe. Yeah, he is trampling out the vintage for the grapes of wrath of sword, sword. He has loosed the vapor lightning of his terrible sword. sword. Uh, I mean, I'm not rejecting any of that, right? In the glory of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let's die to make men free. His truth is marching on. But that's, that's not where he's coming from here. He's going to give you the evidence that this, that this war is turning to the Union side. Nonetheless, despite his promise to avoid occult optimism and avoid speaking in the name of providence, Douglas was not completely beyond the temptation to lapse into millenarian Christian rhetoric that was popular at the time. He said, we have heard much in our other days of manifest destiny. I don't go all to all the lengths to which such theories are pressed, but I do believe it is the manifest destiny of this war to unify and reorganize the institutions of the country, and that herein is the strength, uh, yes, the secret of the strength, the fortitude, the persistent energy, in a word, the sacred sag significance of the war. So the very, so he's not, he's going to use the religious rhetoric too. And uh, how religious he was, we don't know how religious he we really don't know. But we can only say, did use the religious rhetoric. A progressive, a progressive spirit of libertarian, theory, of libertarian history linked to the transcendent will of a world spirit was not entirely absent from his rhetoric. A theological historicism, theological sense of history was present, although less pronounced than that of the German philosopher George William Friedrich Hegel, who, who pontificated Der Fortschritt, Der Fortschritt, Der Fortschritt, Fortschritt, in Bewusstsein der Freiheit. History was the progress of the consciousness of freedom. An enlightened human will, as well as military necessity, was seemingly at work. The history is the collective consciousness of humanity. The material forces are... I got a great poem by Emerson. I'll read you later on if you'd like. Okay. Uh, an enlightened, uh, the, this, was, this, was the, this is the uh, idea, the enlightened human will becomes a historical force. This was Hegelian theory, the theory of, of, of German philosophy, the German philosopher later invoked incidentally by guess who? Guess who invokes this philosopher, Hegel? Martin Luther King. 
and W.E.B. Du Bois are both in big. If you read Stride for Freedom, you'll see that, that Martin Luther King accepts this theory of history. So they want to call him a communist. So he's a, an idealist. He's, 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 he's a, not, not, not a communist, he's an idealist. Ah, uh, the world of the oversoul. This is what this is what Emerson is talking about. The Emersonian historicism that associated providence with a world spirit or oversoul that makes all history sacred. This variety of historical consciousness links the greatness of America not to conservatism or of some original perfection, but in shaping new ideas in response to evolving material conditions. You see, it all comes together. Marx. And and uh, and and uh, and Darwin all get incorporated into this theory of history, which is which is being worked out at the time of the American Civil War. There was a progressive element uh, in the thinking of Jefferson, who never advocated perpetual conservation of the original Constitution. And even Jefferson didn't. This is the point we need to remember. Jefferson was the one who, first of all, Jefferson had nothing to do with writing it because he was in Paris. But, uh, but he also was opposed to the idea that we should stick with it. This is, this, is not, this is not a sacred document. Every 19 years, we're supposed to tear it up and write a new one. Jefferson said, quote, every constitution then and every law naturally expires at the end of 19 years. If it be enforced longer, it is an act of force and not of right. That's Thomas Jefferson. He's supposed to be the most conservative. He was. I mean, if you're looking for Thomas Jefferson, I'm, I'm sorry, my liberal friends. Thomas Jefferson is not the precursor of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Franklin D. Roosevelt stole him. Thomas Jefferson is a precursor of Ronald Reagan in many respects. Considering hostility, but not in that respect. Considering hostility of Jefferson's Democratic Party. Okay, I'm, just, I'm almost done, folks. Considering hostility of Jefferson's Democratic Party to the founding principles of the Republican Party, there is a tragic poetry in the fact that Jefferson's wish for a reform of the Constitution should be ordained by General Grant's progress through his beloved Virginia. Jeffersonian democracy was completely annihilated by Lincoln's reconstruction of the Constitution and the Union. The Republican Party, heir to the Federalist and Whig tradition, rewrote the Constitution. It did so by executive order, by act of war, and by actual constitutional amendments. And the Republican Party remains the party of big government executive orders and, 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 uh, and uh, right on through Eisenhower. Eisenhower is much more like George Washington than many people recognize. This guy is a Whig, just as Lincoln was. It's the party of big business, the party of central government, the party, the party of utilizing military force to for, for civil rights. Um, that's why he didn't get the same state funeral that, uh, that, that Reagan got. Eisenhower. <laughs> Eisenhower is a kind of scary guy. The liberals don't like him, and the Republicans don't like him either. <laughs> the Republican Party, heir to the Federalist and Whig tradition, rewrote the Constitution. It did so by the executive, or, executive order, act of war, and actual constitutional amendments. Douglas stated quite correctly that the Constitution by 1860 was, quote, already broken down by the very people in whose behalf the Constitution pleaded, along with the old union that it had created. Jefferson's idea of rewriting the Constitution had been effected by Lincoln, who with Machiavellian finesse had hijacked the Declaration of Independence, which his Gettysburg with his Gettysburg Address that paraphrased the words of Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave, and turned uh, the interpretation of Justice Taney all 180 degrees around. Douglass, Lincoln also added to the nation's sacred text a new quasi-constitutional phrase, government, by the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Many American co college graduates today, if asked to identify those words, will assert with absolute confidence that they come from the Constitution. But certainly, an equal number of educated Americans realize that they do not. They come, of course, from the Gettysburg Address, and they reveal a democratic-republican ideal quite different from that of the founders and framers, because the founders and framers had a very limited idea of representation, as you can discover if you read the letters of James Madison or the Federalist Papers. <laughs> Or the, or the proceedings of the Congress. They had, they had, our concept of representation is nothing like theirs. 
uh, and who constitu and they had a very different idea of who constituted the people of the United States. And in fact, Patrick Henry, author of the phrase, give me liberty or give me death, had protested that the framers of the Constitution had no right, had no right to draft a Constitution employing the phrase, we the people. And Patrick Henry, by what right do they use this language of we the people? They have no right. Sorry? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Patrick Henry did not think they had a right to use those words. The fact was, as Douglas shrewdly discerned, that the Civil War had altered the national destiny even by January of 1864. American history was inevitably progressing towards the creation of a new union, a new constitution, and a new definition of the American people. In his three meetings with Lincoln, Douglas constantly attempted to push the president beyond the devil's bargain in Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, which had left African Americans stranded outside the realm of citizenship rights and liberties. If you're looking for somebody who's a precursor of Malcolm X, Thomas Jefferson. Lincoln, added and abetted, aided and abetted by Douglas, had rejected the twisted and impossible logic of Je Jefferson's African deportations plan and Henry Clay's American Colonization Society. Lincoln had moved towards the ultimate principle of the 14th Amendment, which made the American citizens into citizens, an attainment he did not live to see, but a goal which, according to all evidence, he already supported. I would not give credit to Douglas for having moved Lincoln towards his progressive positions, but I will give Lincoln credit for continuing to call Douglas his friend and for heeding his counsel, as Douglas constantly encouraged him along the path to the second American Revolution, the regenerated Constitution, and the second American Republic. By his second inauguration, Lincoln had become what Hegel called a world historical figure because he had chosen to view the mission of the war exactly as Douglas had a year in advance. And like Douglas, he had come to realize that history cannot be reduced either to Marxist materialism or to Hegelian idealism. In this paradoxical world of chickens and eggs, the forces of history are reciprocal and obedient to both mind and to matter. The Declaration of Independence had been a clear rejection, a clear rejection of American exceptionalism. And the Civil War had shown that the national destiny was in the tide of material and moral forces that were universal and eternal, not relativistic and situational. As Douglas saw things in 1864, the Second American Revolution had been determined by material necessity but no less by the ideal of liberty. Thank you. Thank you.